So let's just go through what we'll talk about today. I'm, I'm going to give an introduction and of course we've just had an introduction but I think it's quite useful just to hear someone else's perspective because I've got a perspective and, and Mark's got a perspective. I think Mark um, will, you know, just the nature of his job, he, he tends to go to lots of meetings and things so he's got quite a, a global perspective whereas I'm a bioinformatician and um, I have to do some analysis for people and so my world is much smaller like oh someone's given me some data I've got to do something with it and so that will be my perspective really and I'll be introducing a platform to do uh, next-gen sequencing a free platform uh, called Galaxy so I think in the afternoon then you're going to get Genomatics which is a, a commercial product obviously and but this will be a free one so that maybe that would be quite good then you can you can compare that and if you want to just dip your toe in obviously you could use a free one but if you think no I need something a bit more uh, supported or whatever you could um, do that and go for a commercial product. So then using Galaxy in this session we'll be doing a hands-on uh, session where I'm going to give you some sequence data and we'll do your first few exercises on it. Um, I'm not going to be... I've made the data sets quite small so that we can have 20 people run the jobs at the same time and not uh, break our infrastructure and we're going to get as far as actually mapping the data so uh, if you remember the introduction mapping in a way is the starting point from other things but what I'm going to do is take you up to that point and then from there you get into kind of app application specific analysis and we'll be talking about workflows I know some people had an interest in that um, uh, from your pre-course sort of questionnaire so we'll be doing that and that's one of the strengths of Galaxy really. And then I've just ended up with some resources, places to keep an eye on if you need information, that sort of thing. Okay, so here's my introduction. So you'll start off with getting your sample, DNA or RNA. Then as Mark explained, you're going to fragment that you need to fragment it just to measure it okay so the sequences use smaller small fragments to be able to measure it and obviously they're working at making it longer because there are advantages uh, to having longer sequences especially if you're going to use de novo sequencing or also for things like RNA sequencing where you know there's there's all sorts of interesting things that can happen with RNA sequencing uh, sorry with RNA splicing etc and novel transcripts so if you have long sequences it gives you more information but a lot of applications all you want is a count count how many times is this sequence present in my sample and then all you need is a all you need is a length that's long enough to be able to identify where it came from yeah and then you'll go through some sort of reassembly so just looking at that already starts to identify for me the main challenge here for the bioinformatics obviously that's what we're doing today and it's the fact that you've broken things down you've fragmented things okay and this this kind of experiment has already been uh, sort of worked at quite a lot with proteomics and they call that shotgun so shotgun proteomics or shotgun sequencing in this case essentially what you do is it's like you know you blow things to bits and then you've got to somehow try and reconstitute it so that it looks like the original thing and all sorts of um, challenges are involved there with the algorithms etc etc okay but that for me is the key thing here is and, and the, what I'd like to communicate because it comes back time and time again we've got a situation when you extract you, know, you got your sample and it's all 
intact and you're trying to measure that. To measure it, you have to smash it up into pieces. Then, bioinformatically, you're trying to rebuild it. And we're not there yet, and we won't be there for a long time. <coughs> but actually, we can do that and be 100% confident. So hopefully, in, in this course, you can, you can get some handle on that. Uh, there's a few references I've put there. One is just a, a review. It's already out of date. These things go out of date very quickly. But there's an updated list uh, on the Nature site which uh, is worth keeping an eye on. Now, with everything that you learn, you need to learn the jargon, the terminology, and there's already quite a lot of proliferation on that. So let's just have a look at these and go through. So you extract your DNA or RNA, then you're going to sequence it. Before you sequence it, you have to create something called a library. Okay, And there's a lot of different steps that could be done at this point. For example, if you going to do a study of RNA, if you extract some RNA out of someone or some animal, most of that RNA is actually ribosomal RNA. So if you don't do anything to it, that's what you're going to be sequencing over and over ribosomal RNA. Okay, so then this, you, what you need to do is do some cleanup. Um, yeah, so that kind of thing would land under library prep. So there's, there's, there's different decisions to be made before you go and sequence. There's not just one way of doing that. Okay, so if you hear that term, that's what that applies to. Then there's also barcoding. So that's, barcoding allows you to put multiple sequences, multiple samples onto, say, one lane of a sequencer or onto the sequencer. So that's what barcoding is. So what you do is you'll extract your samples. Say you've got 20 samples, you're extracting them. You'll put a barcode onto each sequence, right? So each sequence get a bar gets a barcode. Then you can just pull them and sequence them. And bioinformatically, then, it's quite easy. OK, so that's barcoding. You can then resolve that. And in fact, although I said bioinformatically, often it's just happening even before the bioinformatician gets the data. It gets processed and um, you just get them nicely separated into the separate samples already. But that's kind of at the level of preparation before you sequence something. Right, then there's the sequencing. So we can do just... So generally, you t at the moment, with the, the sequences, say the Illumina sequencer at the moment, which is the most um, popularly used, arguably, I suppose, is... The, the fragmentation tends to be in about 500 base pairs. So then you'll sequence one end, that would be the, f the, the read one, that would be called single end sequencing. But if you want to say something more about the sample in terms of length, say if there was alternative splicing or if you want to do um, an assembly, then you would also sequence the other end. Okay, and that's called paired end. So you, you sequence one end, and then you sequence into the other end. So you sequence in that end, and then you sequence in that end. And like I said, the base, the the fragmentation is usually to about 500. It can be, it can be changed, but that's generally what you have. And then you'll read maybe say 100 into one side, 100 into the other side. So then you've got 300 in between that you know nothing about. But it gives you, if a splicing event, for example, happened in the middle then those two would be sitting on the same fragment of 500 base pairs, but you know on the genome that they're sitting very far apart. Okay. Okay, so that's just some of the terms. I'm quite happy um, to make this much more interactive. So if people have got some questions at any point, or because I've got a cold, and I, I'm not speaking very clearly. I'm quite happy uh, for you to say, can you just repeat that or something? So, so it's paired in just like the bidirectional Tanga sequencing, is it the same for the concept? Yeah, essentially yeah. that's what you do. Yeah. So, like I said, so you've got your, your strand and then you're sequencing from one side, sequencing from the other side. 
obviously, when you get the data, it's, it is it's the same direction, as it were. Um, that all just gets done automatically, but that, that's, that's how that paired end works. Um, You sequence so inwards, yeah. So, so generally, what happens is you'll have. I mean, I'm. This is not really my area. I'm just so. Um, this is more like the what happens the, the technology. But you fragment, and then you put linkers on the end, and so with the Illumina sequ sequencer, you put your um, linkers on the end, and if it's barcoded, the barcode is sitting in the the linker as well. And then one end gets attached onto a flow cell, as it's called. And then to be able to detect it, you have to do some kind of amplification step. And so Illumina uses a bridge amplification. So you've got your 500 base pair fragment like that. This one bends down and sort of just hybridizes with, with something that's on here, that's on the, the, the substrate. And that gets extended again. So you get this kind of bridge amplification to make a cluster of, of reads of this 500 base pair length. And then you use your linkers to do the actual sequencing. So it is done with a polymerase. Um, because obviously each sequence is unique. So you don't, know, you, you know, you don't use random priming. You use a, the, the priming from the, the linkers, that, which is the sequence that you know. So that you sequence in from there and then the sequence down for the, the paired end. Any, any other questions? Like I said, this area is uh, just what I've picked up because I'm now no longer in the in the wet lab, although I used to be. So, yep. Can you explain the library, the, the creation of the library? Yeah, so essentially you extract your RNA uh, from your sample. And then, like I said, you have a fragmentation procedure. So the whole point from when you've got your, your RNA or your DNA sample to when it actually goes onto the machine is called the library prep. Okay. So, so any steps that are being done, so linkers on the end, uh, amplification procedures, fragmentation, and all of those are decisions that need to be made. Obviously, people settle on defaults on how to do that, but all of those events um, Sort of, uh, and so in the end, your, li your, your library might contain one sample, or it might contain a hundred barcoded samples. Um, so, and th then often, often that library is stored for a while. So, you know, if you do the run and something goes wrong, you just go back to your library and you sequence it again. So it's it's all, it's all the kind of the workup. It all happens, kind of. That's the wet lab side of it. Um, and so I apologize if I've made any mistakes in that description, because like I said, I'm now no longer the, the wet lab uh, side of things. But yeah, that's, uh, that's my understanding of it. <laughs>